This is uh, my kitchen table and also my filing system. Over much of the past three decades, I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. Well, I watch your interview because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him. I did no due diligence. Told I have me. something I'd like to sell. <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world. Is that right? <laughs> Over the past half century, one of the most successful business leaders in the United States has been Leonard Lauder. He took a small family company started by his mother, Estee Lauder, and built it into one of the largest beauty companies in the world. He's also become one of the greatest philanthropists in the United States, devoting himself to the worlds of art and the worlds of Alzheimer's research and the worlds of cancer research. An incredible contributor in all of these areas. So at the beginning uh, of this conversation, I should point out to people that Leonard has recently written a book called The Company I Keep, My Life in Beauty. It's an excellent book about his life in the, in, in the world of uh, beauty. So let's go back to the very beginning. You were born in New York City. Absolutely, 1933. Now, your mother is Estee Lauder, but that was not her um, name when she was born. Her first name was not Estee, and her last name was not Lauder. So how did that name come about? Uh, she was Josephine Esther Lauder, and her, and her parents, uh, her mother was Hungarian, and they called her Esty, E-S-T-Y. And so she liked that Esty better than Josephine. When you were growing up, were you in a wealthy family at that time? We were very, very, very poor. Now, re remember this, that uh, this was the Depression. My father had had a very successful business importing silk. Now, silk didn't do, do too well during the uh, Depression. So he, his, his company had to close down. And my mother uh, had always had ambitions to either be an actress or to make people beautiful. And uh, I have a, a, a late friend who had been a high school classmate of hers, and he said she was always combing out her girlfriend's hair and making them look pretty. So that's what she loved doing that, and that became her advocation and vocation. Okay, now when you're talking about your uh, youth in New York City, you do it in great detail in the book. How can somebody remember things that happened 80 years ago? How do you do that? David. It's easier to remember 80 years ago than what I had for lunch today. <laughs> I understand that phenomenon. Okay. So <laughs> your mother is interested in making people more beautiful, but I guess everybody likes to make people more beautiful. So what is it that she did that actually got her started in the cosmetics world? Well, she started to sell the products that her uncle had made. He was an esthetician. And then she decided she could do better and she started making them in the kitchen. And I, as a little kid sitting in my high chair, would watch her make the creams on, on the kitchen stove. Then as time went on, uh, she would invite people to the house uh, to do makeups. And uh, I would come home for lunch every day. I would sit in the kitchen eating my lunch and she'd be next door making, some, making someone's face up. But she was a miracle worker. She, uh, anyone who came in there would undoubtedly walk away looking fantastic. So when you're in high school, uh, you went to uh, which high school? Bronx High School or? Bronx High School of Science, yeah. Okay, that's a pretty good high school. Um, but did you have time to help your mother and father in the company at that time? I worked very often after school every day, uh, except when I was, uh, I was on the soccer team. So when I had soccer practice, I wasn't there, but other than that, I worked every afternoon. And did they pay you or they just said, this is part of growing up? Well, if 50 cents an hour is pay, that's what I got. Okay. So you then went to the University of Pennsylvania where you graduated third in your class. So what was it that you took out of the University of Pennsylvania that you were a good business person or you were a good scholar? What did you want to be when you graduated? I wanted to be in business. I told my parents, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in the business, but my father wanted me to be a chemist. No, thank you. I didn't want to be a chemist because I wanted to do marketing. Okay, so you graduate from University of Pennsylvania, third in your class. 
you want to be in business. So in those days, people would say, well, I guess I'll go to Harvard Business School. So you applied to Harvard Business School and did they accept you? I got turned down flat and uh, which was, which was a, a rather shock for me. However, uh, I made lemonade out of lemons. I applied for the US Navy Officer Candidate School. I was accepted there and uh, that was the beginning of my PhD in leadership. And it's the best thing I've, I ever did. So have you ever thought about how much more successful your life could have been had you gotten into Harvard Business School? <laughs> I wish the people at Harvard would know. I would like to send them a thank you note for what they did to me. Okay, so you go into the US Navy um, where there are a lot of uh, you know, young Jewish boys from the University of Pennsylvania in the Navy with you? When I went into the Navy, uh, my father said, you know, there are no Jews in the Navy. <laughs> I said, okay, I know that too. But that was, that was good. That was the way the United States was. Jews were in the, in the minority. Everyone, everyone was a minority then. But it was fascinating because I grew up, in my view, at the right time to grow up and learn. You, you don't grow up, if you grew up in prosperity, you don't understand how to fight hard. I had to fight hard. So one of your um, activities in the Navy is running the commissary on the boat you're on or a ship you're on. So yeah. uh, how did you manage to make that a very profitable business? And did you realize you were a pretty good business person as a result of making the commissary so pop, uh, profitable? Well, I became the ship store officer aboard a, an aircraft carrier. An aircraft carrier had, uh, we had 3,000 men aboard the carrier. And so I had to get everything that they needed and, and, and then some. So I started to buy perfume that they could send out as gifts to, the parent, uh, uh, to their girlfriends, et cetera. I bought wristwatches, toothpaste, everything you wanted, I had. And uh, I made it a, 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 a point to have that so successful that that supported the entire ship's entertainment policy. After you leave the Navy, you presumably could go do many things. You could get a lot of business op opportunities. Why did you join your parents' company? Because I knew I could make it better. I had a vision of what the company could be and would be, and I didn't have to sell it to them because they, I, I don't think they could see the same thing that I saw. So you joined the company, was it 1958 um, when you joined? Right, yeah. 58. The company has under a million dollars in revenue, more or less? Right, $800,000. Right. What was your job? Did you say to your mother and father, guess what? I'd like to be the CEO. I'd like to be the CFO. What was the job you actually had? My job description was son. <laughs> so I've always uh, wondered when, when you're in business with your parents, uh, do, you, do you call your, your boss mom or do you call her Este? I would call her mom. However, I would always address her in front of other people as Mrs. Lauder out of respect, and uh, it, 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 worked, it worked well. Look, um, <clears throat> they had trust in me from way back. They said, oh, anything that Leonard wants to do, he can do. So your job was basically everything that your mother and father didn't want to do, and your mother was the, became the symbol of the company, really, was the face of the company, is that right? Yeah, they, she did everything, my father did everything, uh, but I was the one who sort of brought it together and my, my vision was make her famous. Everything that I could do to make her famous was a step in the right direction. And she became world famous because of that. How do you keep mentally sharp? What's the key? The brain is a muscle. And if you don't use it, you lose it. What did you do to convince people that uh, your mother's products or your company's products were better than the competitors? Well, two things. Firstly, she created the idea of, of giving gifts away. At the beginning, uh, she would give, uh, send out a, car, a postcard, say, bring this card into the such and such a store and we'll give you a free lipstick or give you a free this or free that. Then she built it up later on to say, we'd give you, if you buy something, we'll give you a gift. 
that 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 was magic in those days. It was really magic. Now, when I tried to, when I became, I took over the sales area. In fact, as I took over everything, I remember visiting the the buyer of a major department store. He wouldn't look at me. He kept his back to me, cleaning his nails. And finally, I said to him, "I think I can do." Great things for you. I can, I can make you a lot of money. And he turned around and said, "How can you do that?" And then we were off and running from there. So I was able to think of the ideas necessary to make a hit and make a big splash, no matter where we were. So, at what point did you realize the company was actually going to be successful in the sense that it was going to survive? Did you always think it was going to become a gigantic global company, or did you have offers to to sell the company at some point when it's small and you thought about doing that? Well, my mother came home one day uh, when I was in high school, saying Charles Revson offered me a million dollars, but I turned it down because I wanted to have the business for you. So I was very grateful for that. Uh, I knew that we were on route and were out of the woods at, at the beginning of nineteen seventy. Uh, and by that time, the company was in demand, and I was then able to turn around and focus on what we could do in the future. Was there something about the products that were better than the others? Did you, did you try to make yours a higher level, higher cost kind of product so that gives it more prestige? They, they were much better products. They were expensive and very, very, very good for the customers. Uh, look. At the beginning, we never advertised. What did we do? We gave out samples and gave out samples that were large enough. If you, if you give a customer a sample of, of a product and they like it and they come back and buy it again and again and again, that's what builds the business. So it was years before we even started to advertise. Now, the brand that you had was called Estee Lauder. That's but correct. At some point, you or somebody, I think it was you, came up with the idea of having a sort of competing brand called Clinique. Right. So what was the idea of building a product with a different brand name that was competing with, in effect, your other brand? Uh, by the time I, I started to work on, on the Clinique, which is in the late 60s, Estee Lauder was very successful by, by the time. And our customers were saying, look, you've only grown 15% this year. We need more, we need more. I didn't want to push Estee Lauder into a way of over promoting the brand because I knew what I wanted to do. So yes, I said, how, if I wanted to compete with Estee Lauder, what would I do? And that became the click. You know, uh, it takes a thief to catch a thief. Remember the movie with, with Cary Grant? It takes a thief. It takes a thief to catch a thief. Now, when I go into a department store and I can't say I'm the biggest shopper in department stores in the Western world, but when I do go in, uh, usually on the first floor, right to your right, you smell some nice fragrances and perfumes and so forth. And I always said to myself, is that because uh, these products are, are kind of leaking out of the, the bottle or, or something like that? I mean, I mean, I thought they were airtight packaging, but I, now in your book, you kind of say, well, you spray it around a little bit to, to attract people. Is that right? That's right, around, spray and spray. So it's very important, as you point out in your book, to be at the right location and uh, you and your competitors, according to your book, would kind of uh, spar over uh, who was going to be in the right location in a department store. Is that right? That's right. But th that's why I said to you that the, the main thing we were watching for and doing was growth. Because every department store in the nation was built not just on the profits that they made, but on the growth percentage. And I made it a point that we would drive the business, our business, faster than any other store, any other brand of any kind in the store. So if the store had, say, a 10% increase, I wanted to have a 15% increase. If they had 20, I wanted to have 30. And I always wanted to have a bigger increase than the whole store would have. When that happened, I would get all the support in the world. Now, if I would go into a drugstore and say, I want to buy an Estee Lauder product, I wouldn't be able to find it. You tried very hard to not go into drugstores and compete with people at the lower price range. Is that right? That's correct. 
And the reason was it makes people think, and I guess it works, that your product is a more upscale, prestigious product. Well, it's, it's more than that, though. Uh, remember, I just mentioned growth. Uh, if you have one department store and up and down the uh, Main Street, there are two or three or four drugstores there. If you divide the business between, the, between everyone, you will not have the growth in that one store. By giving the, the department store the growth at the beginning, they were, they were so happy with, with what we were doing, they gave us a space and location in the store so they could do more. And so the result is we basically helped the department stores grow in that era. If, if it wasn't for us, they wouldn't have had the same growth. So at one point, uh, your company is doing so well that uh, investment bankers who are not shy come to you and say, why don't you take it public? It was a family owned company. Did you want to take the company public? We weren't ready yet. We really weren't. Uh, because uh, when you are a properly held company, you can invest a lot of money in doing what you think is right for the long term and not have to worry about it. So uh, a few moments ago, we were talking about the, uh, the launch of the Clinique. The Clinique cost us millions and millions of dollars of losses to get the brand started. But we weren't public, and therefore we could simply launch it and get it started, and, and, and it happened well. Now, today, it's harder to launch a brand, and, and, and since we're public, we now have to buy brands rather than launching, rather than creating them ourselves. So you bought uh, one or two extremely successful brands. You might mention one or two of your most famous brands that you bought. Well, they weren't so famous when we bought them, but we, we bought a company called Mac, a company called Bobby Brown, a company called Joe Malone, a company called Creme de la Mer, and, and et cetera. So we would buy a company that had already started itself. We kept the entrepreneur working with us, and, and that one hated the other, and sooner or later, we had a, a whole portfolio of brands that competed with each other as well as competing with in the marketplace. When the company did ultimately go public at the end of uh, the last century, I guess it was, then it's very public what your company's worth and what your own net worth is. And was that something that you kind of uh, didn't really want to have people know how quite how successful the company was and people now realize how wealthy you are? Did it change your life in any way? It never changed my life, but I'd rather have no one know if I have any money. I collect the art and give it away. I don't need to show my wealth. I like to spread what I'm doing to make other people better off. Well, let's talk about some of those things you've done. Uh, for example, uh, as a young boy, you got interested in, in postcards. Right. And then you later built one of the biggest postcard collections in, I guess, the world. What was the fascination with postcards? Postcards in those days were the Snapchat of today. Uh, I have postcards that say, see what lunch today. They would mail it before 10 o'clock in the morning and it would arrive in time for lunch at where they were going. So we don't realize that this, this was before the phone was used all the time this way, before email, before everything. And so that uh, I love the idea of postcards because I like the idea of instant communications. And so what did you do with your postcard collection? You still have it or have you put it in a museum somewhere? Well, I've given uh, 80 or 90% of it to uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and a, a good portion of it uh, to, uh, to the Norway Gallery uh, in New York City, which was started by my brother. I don't buy things to possess them. I buy things to give them away. Only things that doesn't mean anything to me. So um, one of the things you've given away is your Cubist art collection, which I'm told is one of the finest, if not the finest in the world. 
What is it about Cubist art that made you want to collect it? And why did you ultimately decide to give this billion dollar plus collection to the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York? Well, first, it's a promise gift, which means it goes to them upon my passing. I've, I've already given them uh, almost half of it already. I, I love the idea of creating things. Now, if I, uh, uh, if I buy a postcard, it could cost me anywhere, anywhere between five cents and a dollar or five or 10, maybe. If I buy a Picasso painting, I could pay 50,000 or $100,000 for it. So to me, I love the hunt and the search. And then I love at the same time, the act of putting it together for a museum and giving it away. So that every time I give something away, I give them money to display it and do exhibitions. So you're now one of the wealthiest people in the United States, but when you were building your art collection, you weren't quite as wealthy. So did you have to worry about getting coming up the money to buy these Picassos? Absolutely, I was in debt, I was up to my ears. You've also been involved with the Whitney and were the chair of the Whitney Museum of Art in New York for a long time and bigger, their biggest donor. Uh, what was it about the Whitney that made you so um, attracted to it? I helped, I bought thousands of works of art for them. And uh, I like making museums successful because when I was a kid, three afternoons out of five after school, if I wasn't doing something else, I was in a museum looking at things. And I love museums and I wanted to make them greater and greater and greater. Uh, let's talk for a moment about another thing you've mentioned. Uh, your first wife um, was very involved with breast cancer. She had had breast cancer and uh, you and she put together a foundation to work on breast cancer. Um, you're still involved with that, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. And your mother, as you point out in the book, uh, in, in the latter years suffered from some Alzheimer's and you've also been involved with Alzheimer's research. Is that an important cause for you as well? Very important. We, I, we, my brother and I both have created the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. We're a pure play. We just do drug discovery for prevention and cure. We don't do care. We don't do anything else. But the research that we're doing is amazing. And in my lifetime, we're going to have a prevention and a cure for Alzheimer's and, and related diseases. So what do you attribute your obviously sharp mind at your age and the good physique at your age? What does you do? You exercise a lot. How do you keep mentally sharp? What's the key? I exercise a lot, number one. And don't forget this, that everyone should know this. The brain is a muscle. And if you don't use it, you lose it. So that uh, each day I'm doing something, not doing the, the crochet puzzles to activate my, my interest. Um, we will read the newspaper in the morning and we'll discuss the matters and where it's just leading to. And I'll make predictions. By the way, I'm very good about this, seeing the future. So I don't have my crystal ball with me, but I can lend it to you from time to time. And uh, I, I can see the future and I, and I work with that, with that knowledge to help in all the things that I'm doing. Okay, any regrets in this uh, life story you've uh, put together? Anything you wish you had done differently? None whatsoever. I really, I, I love every step along the way. I've never regretted anything. I, look, if, if you can't build your life based on what you're looking back to, uh, uh, you can only build your life by looking forward to it, to everything.